All right, so welcome to the PN2 lecture for module seven. We're talking about glucose regulation this week and we've got a few activities. Uh, make sure that you listen to the recorded lecture because most of the meat of this module has been recorded in there. And so we're going to um, spend a little bit of time highlighting a couple of the things that I talked about there. So you'll hear it both places, but then um, I have an activity for us that uh, hopefully you'll find beneficial for you. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, and as always, we're going to start with some announcements. And remember, um, our final exam will be coming up and that is going to be, oh my goodness, I drew a blank on it. Um, I believe it is September 19th. It's that Thursday of week 11 and it's from 10 to 1230. So be sure that you are um, setting aside that time, it is a 100 question exam and you'll have two hours to complete it. Also coming up next week, we have our proctored pharmacology exam. So if you've leveled up and I've had communications with some people who know they've leveled up and reached out to me, uh, those individuals will take an alternative exam that they need to level up on. But if you haven't achieved a level two, you'll need to take the proctored pharmacology during this class. And you've been doing the practice A and B in preparation for it. And um, I did set up a dry run. I had a couple students who um, got new computers and wanted to make sure that Proctorio was working well on their new computers. So there'll be an opportunity today at 11 o'clock. So right um, shortly after the live lecture, there'll be an opportunity for you to um, check out your computer and make sure it's functioning well with Proctorio. And then I did set up another one on Monday, August 24th, again at 11 o'clock. So please reach out to me if you're going to take advantage of that because I have a code I need to give you for um, getting into the dry run. And uh, I don't want to sit there all day if I know nobody is I'm going to be doing it. I do know I have someone today at 11 o'clock, so that will be a go for sure. Um, and if I even have one person, I'll do Monday. Um, just a, another little note for you that, um, you know, one of the resources that we had used at one point um, showed, had a little comment about decreased sodium levels with DKA. So I'm just want to just share a little bit about this, though. Um, it is not uncommon with DKA to have the decreased sodium levels, even with dehydration, because we know we see dehydration with DKA. Um, and but this uh, decrease in the sodium level that uh, may go along with it is due to an osmotic diuresis that occurs um, during the DKA process. So make a little mental note of that. And then in your travels of your journey as a nursing student, and even as you begin your practice as a nurse, um, you're going to see some different values for ABG interpretation. Uh, one in particular is a value called base excess. So, you know, we don't teach the interpretation of base excess at Rasmussen. And I've only had one hospital where I've done clinical where they've used that value, and that was Swedish American. Um, all the others use the standard ABGs that we have been teaching you. But I wanted to just give students just a little understanding of what that means, um, the base excess. So the normal values for that is a negative two to a positive two. And it's actually reflective of the amount of sodium or the HCO3 or the bicarb in the blood. So a high base excess, so greater than a positive two, indicates that there's a higher than normal amount of the bicarb in the blood, which may be due to a primary metabolic alkalosis or a compensated respiratory alkalosis. Um, in comparison, a low base excess, so less than a negative two, indicates that there's a lower than normal, normal amount of the bicarb in the blood. This suggests either a primary metabolic acidosis or a compensated respiratory alkalosis. So not on a test, you don't have to know this. I will have this printed out in the FAQs for you for this week. Um, so just tuck that aside in case you come across it uh, so that you know if you're trying to make sense of some values you see, whether it's in your clinical setting, um, you'll at least have that resource to go back to, but you don't need it for the test, don't focus on it. Um, remember we're doing just the straight ABG interpretation with the pH 
uh, the PaO2, PaCO2 and the HCO3. Um, and then just to remind everyone that the drop date for the course is actually today at midnight. So it's, um, it's always week seven at midnight, the Thursday at midnight. So any questions for me about the announcements or anything we should address? Feel free to unmute. We're a small group today, so it's easy to uh, ask questions with a smaller group if you need to. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. And so what are our three P's of hyperglycemia? The three P's of hyperglycemia. Feel free to chat or... Polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. Thank you. Absolutely. So there they are. Those are the three P's of hyperglycemia. Now, there are other signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia that you need to know as well, but don't forget these three P's. These are very, very um, common, and uh, we're able to see those pretty clearly in patients who are presenting with high glucose levels. All right. And in my announcement, I asked you to uh, have a sheet available to you of a worksheet that I put out there on oral hypoglycemic agents. And so if you have that worksheet out, um, when we've had a face-to-face -face class, I've had an activity where people have worked on some information, filling that out and then sharing it. Um, but what I really find is students get the most out of those worksheets when they complete the entire worksheet by themselves. So I have included them for you as a tool, not required, not turned in, not graded, but a tool for you to be able to organize your understanding of these uh, different medications. But what I wanna do is draw your attention to some key concepts about a few of these. Um, for starters, uh, write down chart 64-2. That's a great resource in your textbook that um, is very concise, a great way to go and study um, and to pull some of the information that you need uh, for understanding these medications and for the test for that matter. So the first medication I'm going to talk to you about is glipizide. Um, so glipizide is one of the sulfonylurea agents. It's um, All of these are oral um, hypoglycemics, as the title indicates. Um, very important to remember to avoid NSAIDs, so ibuprofen, Aleve, um, with this medication. It can actually increase the effects of the glipizide and can cause blood sugars to go too low. So with glipizide, we're avoiding NSAIDs. Um, metformin, um, lots of people are on metformin. Um, Glucophage is the uh, brand name for that. Uh, people should avoid alcohol. Um, I think that's probably one of the main things they don't do. <laughs> um, at least the people in my life who are on metformin are not avoiding alcohol, but they should. And probably one of the most important things to remember about this is that if you're, if a person's going to be having an imaging test, so an X-ray, CT scan, um, MRI, uh, or you know any kind of imaging test that involves contrast agents, they should um, they have to stop this medication. Ideally, you stop it the day of the test um, and not take it the day of the test if it's a planned test. Um, but absolutely, after the test, you have to hold it for 48 hours. Okay, minimally 48 hours. If you know you have a patient who already has some renal involvement, some renal impairment, um, we may hold it longer. They may actually check their renal function before they resume it. So it doesn't happen too often that they go to that extreme. Usually we just hold it for two days after. Now, like I said, it's ideal if you can hold it the day of the test, but sometimes people come in in an emergent situation and they've taken their metformin for the day. We don't wanna delay the imaging because of that. Um, they'll go ahead and do the imaging test. If they've had chest pain, they'll do an angiogram. There's contrast with that. They'll go ahead with it. But knowing that they've taken it is important because we may give them some mucomist or they may start a bicarb drip to support and protect the kidneys um, in preparation for the test. So, um, but they won't delay it. But then always 48 after, hours after testing, we're going to hold that because uh, it can cause um, Kidney, kidney injury in and of itself, even in a healthy, a person who has healthy kidneys to start with. 
All right, and then the DPP4 inhibitors. So those are your Genuvia and your Trigenta. And instruct patients to be alert and observe for a rash or other signs of an allergic reaction with this drug class. There's a, a, a moderately high incidence of drug allergies with these. So just make people aware. And obviously, if they experience some type of an allergic reaction, they should discontinue taking the medication and notify their doctor. And um, they need to look at an alternative treatment to manage their glucose levels. So it's not that you just stop and ignore it. You They need to call their doctor. All right, and then the next class that I wanna talk about is the sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors. So make sure that if you have a, a client who's taking this medication, that they know what the signs and symptoms of a UTI or a urinary tract infection is, such as uh, frequency of urination, pain and burning when they urinate, and the foul uh, urine odor. Uh, there's a high incidence of UTI with this because of how this medication works. So if you don't know how it works, make sure you're looking that up. Go to that chart 64.2, tells you all about it. And um, the person actually excretes the glucose in their urine. And so there's a higher level of glucose in the bladder, in the urine that's in the bladder. And of course it, you know, might adhere itself to the urinary tract wall as it's making its travels from the kidneys out of the body. And that puts that person at risk for that. Um, and then of course for women, instruct them to be alert for any genital itching or vaginal discharge because there is a higher increase um, for risk of yeast infections, genital yeast infections with this medication as well, all for the same reason, all the extra sugars that are in there and um, in that area of the body can, can lead to that. So those are the main things I wanted to draw your attention to about your oral hypoglycemic agents. And I'm going to, well, let's see here. We're going to move on to a little activity. So in the announcement, I asked you to complete the who's keeping an eye on me activity that is in Blackboard and to have it completed and ready for you um, at for this class. So I'm going to stop sharing because you don't need to just look at this slide. You can see me and we can interact a little bit and I can actually see who's with me today. So, okay, good. So what we're going to do, um, pull that out. If you haven't pulled it out, you know, Try to get it up on your computer so you can see it. You're going to need the insulin chart that I put in there. That was just updated in June. There was some changes that um, were made to some of the peak actions. And so we're going to talk our way through this and I'm just going to have you chat with me um, some of your answers for this if you'd like. Um, and obviously you don't have to, but this this is an activity that's important that you complete because your patients, when you give them insulin, you need to know when they're going to be at high at risk for developing hypoglycemia based on the type of insulin that you gave and the time of day that you gave it. So um, I have you go through this to think of, to, to put it into practice. Um, honestly, there's going to be an exam question, at least one on it where you're going to have to make a decision. So um, what I want you to focus on on the chart is actually the peak action. So the peak of it is when they're most likely to develop the hypoglycemia. So I have the chart in front of me and I'm looking at regular insulin and we gave it at 730. So what time, what assessment times, so it'll be a range that you should be, you know, keeping a closer eye on that patient and looking for signs of hypoglycemia. So feel free to chat. 8.30 to 12.30? Yeah, 8.30 to 12.30. Thank you. Thank you for unmuting and, and talking. So that's awesome. All right. Someone's typing it in. Oh, now people. <laughs> but I really yeah. did do it. <laughs> so, no, it's good. And, you know, this is an activity to help you. If we were in the classroom, I actually had the worksheet I handed students, and they took the time to fill it out and to work through it, and then we'd go over it as a class. This online environment, we're just having to adapt. So I put it out there for you to work on ahead of time and then thought we would use some of the class time to actually go over it. 
All right, our second medication is our Glargine or the Lantus, and we gave that at eight o'clock. So when do we have a peak for this med for this insulin? Isn't it continuous for that one? So yeah, we... yep, exactly. Somebody just, a K just typed in no peak. So absolutely no peak with the Lantus. Lantus is a long acting insulin. It gives a very steady state of glucose control. And you'll see a lot of patients um, taking this Lantus um, once or twice a day they'll schedule it and um, but it is a steady release um, actually over like 24 hours or so. So there's no peak with that. Doesn't mean you don't keep an eye on your patient, but regular assessment times for that patient. All right, our next one is Humalog or Lispro and we gave it at 1700. So 1730 to 1730, 1900. Yes. One? 20? All right. <laughs> 20. 20. 0. Yeah. 0.5 to 2.5. Yes. So excellent. my numbers. Exactly. Excellent. So 1730 to 20, you know, 20. And actually with the changes, I didn't update mine. So I got that updated, but you are absolutely correct. So. You know, we're looking, you know, we gave it a supper time. We're checking that patient around 530 to 8 o'clock at night, keeping a close eye on them. Okay, our next one is Detamir or Levamir. We gave it at 2100. Sorry, I forgot to add that part. Gave it at 2100. Okay, yeah, so midnight to 11 a.m. So that's kind of scary, isn't it? You know, we we give this Levamir at bedtime, hopefully not, hopefully they give it a little sooner, but you know, they could be peaking during the night while they're sleeping. And that happens, you know, if you've, if you happen to be an LPN or you've worked in healthcare and are doing the night shift, it's not uncommon for patients to wake up or have trouble waking up because their glucose levels are low. So we have to keep a really close eye on those patients um, who are getting insulins that peak during their sleeping hours. All right, NPH, and we gave it at 1700. Have anybody wanting to share? I think right. there, is there it, we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so 2300 to 5 a.m. is correct for that one. Good. Now, our next one, we're giving two types of insulin. We're giving NPH and regular at seven in the morning, and that's pretty common to do that. So, what are our times of assessment? So just eight and eight. Okay, we're going to start assessing at eight in the morning. Okay, so 
and that would be for our regular insulin. So when would our regular insulin stop peaking? So it started at eight and it would end at? Noon. Noon, good. So eight to noon. And then our NPH starts to peak at what time? One o'clock. Yeah, exactly. Until? Seven. Yes. So one to seven or 1300 to 1900. So good. Make sure you're practicing your military time because you'll use it all the time in healthcare. All right, and then our last one, we have Glargine or Lantus and Humalog, which is also called Lispro, and we gave it at eight in the morning. So when are we looking for a peak in insulin? Good, 8.30 to 10.30, thank you, Isabel. Yes, 8.30 to 10.30. So, you know, the, what you're probably going to see as a, an exam, a type of exam question is, you're gonna be told what type of insulin it was, was given and at what time, and then you'll be asked at which time should you assess for hypoglycemia, and then you will have not ranges, but you'll be given some specific times and you'll have to choose the specific time that is correct. Okay, so just so you know what to expect with that. All right, any questions about this? All right, so the next activity that we're going to do um, and this, if we were in a live classroom, I'd divide you up into teams, um, but we can't do that. So we're having to adapt a little bit. We're going to play Jeopardy, and it's called Diabetes Jeopardy. So how it's going to work is I'm going to pick somebody randomly to pick a category and a point value, and that person will pick that point value and we'll ask the question and then you can chat in privately to me the answers. And so this is hopefully going to brush you up on some concepts related to diabetes. And, um, and last quarter, even though we had to do it a little different, the students thought it was pretty fun. So I think you'll find it to be beneficial. So I need to share my screen. All right, can everybody see the screen okay? Okay, good. Um, so we're gonna work our way through this and uh, it's possible that um, you're not gonna hear anything from this. There's music and stuff that's with it. It's actually more annoying, I think, than helpful, um, but, <clears throat> but we'll find our way through it. So let me get it going here. All right, so our categories are going to be labs, hypo, hyper, PO, insulin, and miscellaneous. I'm going to turn my volume down just a little because that is really loud <laughs> in my ears. Did you all hear any of that music? <laughs> Oh. No, we can't. I didn't, I didn't think so. I didn't think for some reason we weren't able to get it to go through either. So it had the wonderful Jeopardy music that went along with it. That's kind of fun. Okay, so let's see here. I'm just looking at my chat screen. And um, Ray, you're the last person who chatted to me. So I'm going to let you pick the first category. Miscellaneous for 100. Okay, miscellaneous for 100. I can get it to go. There we go. Risk factors include elevated BMI. So remember, this is related to diabetes. So what is type so, 2 diabetes? Yeah, 
That's good. Yeah. And so it's absolutely fine if you, if I pick you and you know the answer, you can do what Ray just did and answer it. That's great. Or people can chat in privately. So I'm going to try to work my way through and capture everyone and give you all a chance to answer. Oh, well, I don't know why it's doing that. Let's see here. In a little night. There we go. What is type 2 diabetes? So excellent. All right. So we'll go back to our screen and um, Echo, I'm going to have you choose the next category, please. Um, let's do PO for 100. Okay. PO for 100. Double jeopardy. Ooh. This is the type of diabetes treated with oral hypoglycemic agents. Hi. All right. Good. Make sure um, if you can remute yourself, that would be great. So lots of chatting of answers coming in. So the correct answer is what is type 2 diabetes? Good. Okay, Renee, would you help us out next? Yeah. Um, sure, I will do, um, let's do insulin for 100. Okay, insulin for 100. Cloudy, that's your clue. Good, lots of good chatting. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and show the answer. And the correct answer is, what is NPH insulin? All right, Yvonne, would you help us with the next category? Or the next question? Sure, let's do labs for 500. Ooh, go big or go home. Labs for 500. All right, looks like you got to interpret this. Metabolic acidosis. Okay, so it is metabolic. Is it, um, just to add to this, is it uncompensated, partially compensated? Oh, geez, I'd have to get out my tic-tac-toe and look. <laughs> All right, can anybody help her out in the chat or unmute and help her out? All right. I'm not sure if you need more time or the partial. There we go. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. Partially compensated. Excellent. So So what is partially compensated metabolic acidosis? Okay, Natasha, would you help us with the next one? Yes, let's do miscellaneous for 200. Miscellaneous for 200. Normal serum ketone levels. Are we normally negative for ketones? Yes, we are. What are negative or none? Very good. Excellent. All right, Carrie, would you help us with the next category? Let's do labs for 300. Labs for 300. Ketones are present in this hyperglycemic state.
There we go. Lots of chatting in here. So good. I'm going to go right to the answer. And we have what is diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA? All right, Kelsey, would you help us with the next one? Oop, not sure what just happened there. Bear with me. Guess we're doing 200 with labs, whatever I just did. Um, let's see if we'll go up. Okay, not sure what just happened there. So this measures glycemic control over three months. I just picked the A1C. next one by mistake. A1C, good. All right, now I think we can get back on track. I couldn't get my house to come back up. So hemoglobin A1C, good, all right. Where was Kelsey able to join us or pick one? Yeah, let's do hypo hyper for 300. All right, hypo hyper for 300. Polyuria is assessed with this condition. Hyper. Hyper, good. So hyperglycemia. All right. And next, um, let's see here. Who haven't I called on? I'm looking through the list. Alina, would you help us out? Let's do hyper hypo 400. Hypo hyper for 400. Severe cases are treated with glucagon, one milligram IM or sub Q. Hypo. Awesome. So what is hypoglycemia? All right. Looking to see who I haven't called on yet. Chris, are you with us? Is your Wi-Fi working for you finally? Maybe not. Okay, I'm gonna go back to Carrie. We'll do hypo hyper for 500. Hypo hyper for 500. Severe cases are treated with IV regular insulin. Hyper. Very good. What is hyperglycemia? So that would be DKA or HHNS that we would treat with the IV insulin. All right, Ray, would you like to pick a category? Um, miscellaneous for 300. Miscellaneous for 300. This electrolyte will decrease with insulin administration. Glucose? It's not an electrolyte. Oh. Anybody able to help her? It's potassium? Yeah, good. We've got people chatting in too. So potassium, excellent. So what is potassium? All right, uh, Natasha, back to you. Miscellaneous for 400, please. Miscellaneous for 400. Fluid balance state in diabetic ketoacidosis. So 
So this is fluid balance, not pH balance. So we're looking for the fluid balance. So hypovolemia or hemoconcentrated, all of those are correct, yeah. Hypovolemus, yes, all of those are correct. What is dehydration, hypovolemia, or a fluid deficit? All of those work. Okay, trying to see who all we have here in the class with us. Echo, would you help us out this time? Um, let's do PO again for 300. PO for 300. Avoid NSAIDs when taking this oral diabetes medication. So we went over that just a little bit ago. Anybody know the answer to that? Glipsidine or dye, whatever. Glipizide? Yeah, yes. Glipizide is correct. What is glipizide or glucotrol? So, good. All right. Carmela, are you able to choose a category for us? Hello. Um, I will take insulin for 300. Insulin for 300. Let me call you right back. Uh -oh. Insulin with no peak. Um, what was it? Leva. We just did it. Um, the Lantus. Yes. Good. What is Lantus? I'm sorry. All right, what is Glargine or Lantus? Excellent. All right, and Jennifer. Uh, how about labs for 400? Labs for 400. All right, so if we were doing it in class, we do a double jeopardy with that. So glucose check frequency when receiving regular insulin drip. Really? All right. Correct answer is hourly. Yes. So whenever we have an insulin drip going or IV insulin, we have to check it hourly, at least hourly. All right. Who haven't I called on? Did I miss anybody? I think I might have, I think our class size diminished. <laughs> okay, Renee, would you help us out again? Um, we can lab for 200. Labs for 200. Measures glycemic control over three months. I think we did that by mistake earlier when I was, I hit the scroll thing. So I'm going to just go to the answer. So it was hemoglobin A1C. So would you help us out again? <laughs> um, PO for 200. Okay, thank you. PO for 200. Must be discontinued if receiving IV contrast. Yes, excellent. What is metformin or glucophage? All right. And then Yvonne, would you help us? How about PO for 400? PO for 400. This medication has a high rate of drug allergy. Mm. This one's a harder one. We talked about it a few minutes ago, but. Uh, I don't know. What is lingo? I don't know how to, I can't even read my writing. 
linagliptin and citagliptin. I don't know how to say these. You did really well. <laughs> nice job. All right. So yes, the DPP4 or the linagliptin and the citagliptin. Nice job. <laughs> All right, let's see who, Alina, would you help us out with the next one? Hypo hyper 200. Hypo hyper for 200. Diaphoresis and reduced cognition are assessed with this condition. Hypo. Okay. Hypoglycemia. What is hypoglycemia? Excellent. All right. Carmela, you want to help us again, please? Um, hypo 400. Hypo, hypo for 100. Hypo, hypo. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Last one. Treated with 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrates. Hypo. Okay, good. What is hypoglycemia? Excellent. Carrie, can you help us again? Let's do insulin 500. Insulin for 500. Most concentrated insulin. All right. I've got some answers chatting in. Some correct, some not. Okay, I did have a correct one, so I'm going to go ahead and show you the correct answer. What is U500 insulin? So if you're giving U500 insulin, it's five times as concentrated as regular insulin, which is considered a U100 insulin. And uh, very, very important that you are being super careful with it, not just with the patient that you're giving that insulin to, but also to any patients who maybe on that unit and making sure you don't grab the wrong insulin because if you're intending to give them u100 and you give them u500 they're probably going to have a pretty pretty bad outcome from that all right uh let's see here jennifer would you help us how about miscellaneous for 500 miscellaneous for 500 all right. Severe hyperglycemic state in type 2 diabetes. Okay, and this is type 2 diabetes, not type 1 diabetes. Echo, you're on the right track. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to show you the answer to it. It is hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic syndrome, or HHNS. You might also see it called HHNK. They're the same thing. Um, but HHNS is what the, the term I'm seeing more uh, with that now. Um, it's different from DKA. S uh, symptoms are very, very similar. So make sure you spend some time in the recorded lecture resources looking at the difference between the two. Because there is a difference. One we see with type 1 diabetes, the other with type 2. All right, Kelsey, can you help us out with the next one? Let's do labs for 200. We've already done labs for two, but oh, we have okay. 100. Oh, for 300. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong ones. Okay, sorry, PO for 500. PO for 500, excellent. Has a high incidence of UTIs, another hard one.
Canaglyphosone. I don't know how to say this. What is? <laughs> <laughs> Good try there, though. All right, we're going to go to the answer and show it to you. All right. So it's your sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors. So the Farziga, I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that right, to be honest, and the Jardians, um, those are the, the ones that have that high incidence of UTI. So that was a hard one. All right, and Echo, or did I just have you pick Echo? Um, I was a while back, but. Okay. Um, yep, to your left. Insulin for 400, please. Insulin for 400. Lispro, insulin peak. So the peak for Lispro. It's a half hour to two and a half hours. Okay, good. I'm hoping I updated this. <laughs> I think I did last quarter. I did. <laughs> Excellent. I think last quarter I had it off. I hadn't updated it with a new resource. So perfect. So 0.5 to 2.5. All right. Kelsey, would you help us again? Um, insulin for 200. Insulin for 200. Order for mixing NPH and regular insulin. Cloudy, clear, clear, cloudy. Okay, nice job. All right, so cloudy, clear, clear, cloudy, or you can do NPH, regular, regular NPH. Okay, very good. You know, some places are still um, doing the mixing of the insulins. Other places have gone away from it. They are using pre-mixed um, vials or insulin pens, so it's hard to say. We still need to know this, and we still need to know it for NCLEX. All right, and Yvonne, would you choose our last category for us? <laughs> sure. Labs for 100. <laughs> After I called on you, I'm like, that was dumb. <laughs> All right, labs for 100. Normal serum glucose levels. It 70 to 110. 65 to 110 is the values we're using for the Rasmussen resource we have. Okay. So, but you were close. And some hospitals, that is their range. They start at 70, but our resource that we were asked to use is 65 to 110. All right, so we have one question left. This is Final Jeopardy. So if we were keeping score, you'd be making a wager how much your team was going to wager. And our question is, this condition in patients with diabetes can lead to kidney failure. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and you can chat in if you'd like. So it's, it's not just hyperglycemia. There's actually a, a condition that's a result of the hyperglycemia. Are we ready for the answer? Okay, we're ready for the answer. At least one person's ready for the answer. <laughs> one person chatted in to me. Okay, your, your answer is, what is diabetic nephropathy? So the nephro is your kidneys. So what can result with chronic hyperglycemia is that the kidneys start to um, the cells in them actually start to die, and it's called diabetic nephropathy. All right. Hopefully that was beneficial. 
that's neuropathy. So nephropathy and neuropathy are two different things. So neuropathy is numbness and tingling in the extremities. And nephropathy is um, the, the cells dying in the kidneys. All right. Don, are those questions available anywhere for like a study guide? They aren't. I don't have a resource created for that. Um, but you, by all means, can go but through it. You record it, right? Yep, it's recorded. So you can okay. go through it, listen to it again, and just take some quick notes since right. you're trying to think of the answer and um, use it as a study time for yourself as well. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. All right, I'm trying to get back to my other PowerPoint. We've got a little bit of time left, and I want to take full advantage of the time that we have. All right. And so I have, because um, I never know if I'm going to have a few extra minutes or not, I put in here some um, NCLEX style questions. So we'll just spend this little bit of time going through these. I'm going to share my screen again for you and uh, just chat in privately the answers to these as you see them. Um, these may actually be in your PowerPoint. If they're not, let me know. These I can easily make available to you. But they might be in your um, in your PowerPoint that you have. All right. So take a minute and chat in, and then we'll talk about the answer for each of these. Get my chat open. I'm not seeing. Okay, so lots of chatting in for this. And yes, the correct answer is D, which is metformin. So we've talked about that today about holding that insulin. Let's get to our next question. And I'll let you read it. I'm not going to read to you. Okay, lots of good chatting coming in. Okay. So the correct answer for this one is C. Those with type 2 diabetes still make insulin, but in inadequate amounts. Another thing you might see about that is that their cells may not be able to use the insulin that's made. So that is another uh, characteristic of type 2 diabetes. But of the choices that are there, C is the correct choice. Okay. This one will take a little thinking on your part. This next one, there's lots to look at, so I'll give you a minute. This one's a tough one. I'll be honest, I don't feel it's a very well-written question. This was pulled off a resource I was provided.
I think we'll take a minute and talk our way through this question when the time comes. Okay. <clears throat> So let's look at what the question's asking. We have all this information up here, which is really good information to know. Um, but the question is asking, after completing the above assessment, which complication of diabetes does the nurse report to the primary health care provider? So um, this complication of diabetes is like our main concept. So we're making sure, first of all, that each of these choices is actually a complication of diabetes. So poor glucose control, um, that could be a complication of diabetes, right? But what is our A1C? You know, we're at 6.9. So it's, it's not perfect, but it's not horrible. And let's see, they don't tell us if this is fasting, this glucose level but I would assume it's fasting, so it's high. So we do have some glucose control issues here. So, so that's important. You know, this, this is a really tough question. Um, uh, visual changes. So is that a complication of diabetes? Yes, it could be a complication of diabetes. So we wanna make a mental note of that. Um, but the client states that they wear eyeglasses to read. So that's normal. They're not telling us based on what's happening that they have, um, that they're not being able to see. Yeah, and Yvonne just chatted it. And the client's 52. They need cheaters. Yes, they do. Or bifocals, <laughs> transition lenses. Uh, yes, that does happen to us when we hit that age. All right. Um, but in this case, our client doesn't state that. So we're not going to report that because it's not happening based on the physical assessment that we completed. Um, respiratory distress. So first of all, it's not a complication of diabetes. So that would eliminate it right there. But we also have lungs that are clear. So that's not something we're going to report. And then decreased peripheral perfusion. So in this case, we know that that can be a complication of diabetes, and we have a right great toe that's toe that is modeled and cold to touch. So that's pretty important. So we've got poor glucose control, but it's not um, at the DKA level or anything. You know, it's not the patient is not in a crisis right now related to their glucose levels but we do have a negative outcome happening here. So um, honestly, I, I think this question could have been um, worded better as in which is the highest priority to report because I think the poor glucose control is appropriate, but definitely the decreased peripheral perfusion based on the assessment that we found is higher priority. So hopefully that helps you to think through some of these questions. And um, I have some more. We are at 10 o'clock. I'm happy to keep going and going over some of these. Do you want to keep going? Or um, well, let's just say this. I'm going to keep going. If you want to stay with me and go through this, that's great. If you need to go because you're, the time you've set aside has been used, then um, I completely respect that. So, But I'm going to keep going through these because I think there's value in it. All right, next question. I am still recording. Yes, somebody, I just saw the chat. I'm going to keep it going. Absolutely. So if you need to go, you can come back and listen to this last part if you need to. Okay, I've got some good chats coming in. All right. So let's just take a look at the question. So we're teaching a client with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes about weight control. So that's background um, foundational information that we need to know about this situation. And then what they're asking is, which comment indicates a need for further teaching? So which comment below tells us that this client doesn't fully understand what's going on? So I'm going to start at the bottom and start with D. Um, I will monitor my blood glucose level daily. Um, 
so they're type 2 diabetes. It's not uncommon for them to only need to, you know, check their blood glucose once a day. Usually that fasting one in the morning is when they check. So that would be okay. Um, if I lose weight, I may not need to use the insulin anymore. And that is true. Uh, there are great results with people with type 2 diabetes. If they get their weight down, they not only can be off any insulin that they were on, but they may actually get off the oral medications if they get the lifestyle changes. I had a friend of mine who I quilt with, and she is, I think she's 74 now. And a year ago in January, so a year and a half ago, she was having some health issues, mobility issues, and decided, okay, it's time to lose weight. And she got super focused on managing her diabetes, got that blood got her weight down, she lost 40 pounds. She got off all of her diabetes medications that she's been on for probably over 20 years. Incredible. And she's still maintaining that. She's still managing it. So weight loss is huge for people with type two diabetes. All right, so that's true. Um, I will monitor my diet and avoid empty calories. So yes, concentrated sweets are the enemy of somebody with type two diabetes or type one for that matter. So, you know, avoiding that. So that is true. So B, C, and D, we wouldn't be choosing. So, but I will begin exercising for at least an hour a day. And actually the recommendations are a half hour a day. You know, when you tell people an hour a day, they often can't fit it in and so they do nothing. So um, they have found the evidence supports a half hour a day has added value to that individual. So that is why A is the answer to that one. All right, next question. Okay, I've got some answers coming in here. Good. And so, um, you know, we're working with a patient with diabetes and trying to encourage them to wear a medical alert bracelet and impressing upon them the importance of it. You know, what is the value to you of um, hyperglycemia? Medical emergencies, however, Hypoglycemia does. Um, so if I become hypoglycemic, I could become unconscious. Now that is true. We know that that is absolutely true. And, you know, logically they wouldn't be able to communicate that they are, that they have diabetes. And so the people who would be responding to care for them um, would need that piece of information. And there's never the guarantee that there are loved ones around who can communicate that. So a medical alert, uh, piece of jewelry or or device is so important. Has nothing to do with insurance um, and or admission to the hospital. They're going to treat in the hospital anyway, even without that. So, all right, that one was probably an easier one for you. Next question. All right, I see some chats coming in. So this question is a great technique. Uh, it's a teach back. Um, you ask them you know, tell me what you would do if you suddenly feel hungry and shaky. And so their response can indicate whether you need to do more teaching or not. Drinking a glass of water, it's not going to help them in the least. No calories, no carbohydrates in that. Um, I will eat three graham crackers. And so that one is appropriate. We've got carbohydrates in there. Um, 
they'll give themselves a milligram of glucagon. So that is sub Q and I am, and your patient is talking and able to respond to this. So that would only be used um, if they weren't responsive and um, somebody else would administer that. We typically don't give ourselves glucagon. If we are in a condition where we could give ourselves, that's not the best choice. Take something to eat, take it in orally. Or they'll sit down and rest. The sit down and rest isn't going to change those glucose levels either. So, all right, next one. Okay, I'm seeing some chats come in. Good. And yes, um, the ones that have come in have all chose C. So in this situation, you know, you're going to learn this technique with a lot of conditions. You want to be present where your patient is and, you know, find out what's concerning them most. If you can take care, you know, if it's just working with the, the needle, the insulin, that's their biggest concern. You know, we can alleviate that and then they're more open and we can teach all the other things that they need to know. But if they are so nervous about um, this condition and we're trying to get them to make diet changes and um, exercise changes, they're not going to be open to it because they're focused in on another concern. So find out what that concern is and let's just take things one at a time. You know, those lifestyle changes, you don't have to make them all at once. Let's do, you know, one every week or one every two weeks and make these changes to the diet and to the lifestyle. All right, good job. And the next one. So a few answers coming in here. So one of the first things you need to know to answer this question is you have to have the knowledge of what a normal hemoglobin A1C is. So you know what that normal is. In this case, um, this client is pretty high. 9.4 is pretty high. So does that tell us that they're doing well or that we're not getting good control with that? You know, that's the first thing you wanna ask yourself. And so in this case, you know, we say it's high, it means that they're not, and you need to know what the significance of this lab is. It means hemoglobin A1C measures glucose control over three months. So it's not just that they had one incidence of elevated blood glucose levels. It means that over a three month period, they have been elevated consistently over that time frame. And so we know they're not getting really good control. Um, so you need to have an increase in your insulin dose. That may be true, but that is, may, is not the best response because we don't know what's leading to this. You know, sometimes, you know, we don't want to just keep giving them more medications and more insulin because um, that can have negative effects on a patient too. We want to find out, you know, do we need to do some more teaching about the lifestyle changes um, and get that under control? So, and maybe it's not the insulin dose. Uh, maybe it's they're on an oral hypoglycemic and they have this level. And so to give them another dose of metformin or a, a, a second oral diabetes medication, we're not really helping them be healthier. We need to help them to get it under control. All right, so saying keep up the good work, not good work. We know this is too high. Um, this is not good at all. Um, that's true, but that's not a therapeutic response. Um, 
And so we should try to avoid that, even with the expressions on our face, like, oh, my 9.4, you know, so you kind of have to have your poker face on, your game face on. And so D is the correct answer. Have you been doing something differently? So that helps us to explore with the patient, you know, what's going on in their life. Um, maybe they have added stress. Um, maybe they're having financial problems and, you know, we all know that cheap um, carbohydrates, cheap carbohydrates are more affordable than um, healthy foods. So that could be their issue. So helping them to explore that's really important. All right, next question. Okay, I got a couple answers coming in. I'm going to give you just a few more minutes to think about this. Okay. Every time you see a question that says, which client does the nurse assess first? Think to yourself, which one of these clients has the highest chance of tanking on me or going bad um, first? So that's what we're really assessing for. Um, all of these patients need to be seen. They wouldn't be at the doctor if they weren't, but which one is in a crisis or has the potential to be in a crisis the quickest? And so if we look at A, um, we've got somebody who's taken Prandon who has nausea and back pain. So not comfortable, they've got, they're nauseated and back pain, but there's, if you go with the ABCs, there's nothing of the ABCs that's um, identified there. B, we've got a client taking glyburide who is dizzy and sweaty. And so, um, you know, we're talking about diabetes medications. So does this patient have a sign and symptom of hypoglycemia? We know that hypoglycemia can be, um, uh, it can be a medical emergency. So we want to put a little flag next to this one and consider this one, because we know that the dizziness and sweatiness are early signs of hypoglycemia. And then we have a patient taking metformin who has abdominal cramps. So um, obviously they're not feeling very good. This is actually one of the side effects of metformin. Um, having some GI issues is pretty common. Um, so not a high priority, not the ABCs, not related to hypoglycemia. We can set that one aside. And then we have your patient taking the Actos who has bilateral ankle swelling. So again, um, it's bilateral, so we're not worried about a DVT related to circulation. Um, we know what's happening on both sides. Definitely a concern for this patient. Definitely needs to be seen, but not the highest priority. So that takes us back to B. B is the uh, patient who's most likely to have a negative outcome quickly. All right, and then this is going to be our last one. And actually, this question is going to be a little tricky. You may actually end up picking two of these.
Okay, so we've got our Lantus and our List Pro, and we know that the Lantus doesn't have a peak, so we're not going to be concerned about that for an episode of hypoglycemia. Um, but our List Pro has a peak of 0 0.5 to 2.5. And so actually with this question, this was based on a, a different resource um, that was put together. Um, the correct answer would be either A or B for this one. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And what questions do you have for me before I let you go? We ran a little over, but I think there was good value and anyone who didn't have time could definitely uh, choose not to participate in the, those NCLEX question practice at the end. Hey, Don. Yes. Did you the answer to the last, the last question? I just missed it. Yes, A and A or B, according to our insulin table that's out there that we're using. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, girl. All right. Any other questions? I'm going to stop recording.